you very much. Can you hear me all right? It's really an honor to be here, and thank you so much, Chip, and uh, other uh, museums and staff members who have contributed to uh, making this exhibition possible. It is um, the best exhibition of my work that I have seen to date, and it's very much an honor. start with uh, some text on the slides just to kind of get me going. <laughs> um, my work examines desire mostly towards it and death, but death is actually uh, pretty much it. Any allusions to lust are simply ruses which allow me to lead you back into some dark alley where I can speak to you candidly about our impending demise as individuals, <coughs> as a culture, as a species. And I guess in going to Juarez, I, I met a landscape that looked like what goes on on the backside of my own brain. Uh, so I felt very much at home there. Just before meeting first uh, Charles Bowden, uh, I was involved in uh, creating a series of drawings about medical technology, which interested me uh, because it both constructs and threatens our sense of humanity. So I was minding my own business doing this series of drawings. And then one of the last pieces that I created was a uh, rendition of Montaigne's uh, Dead Christ, which was the first painting that really captured my imagination. I did the first drawing of it when I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And this particular piece came later even though it was initiated as a sort of open heart surgery on uh, Montaigne's work, it came to stand for the, the situation in Juarez where a city is uh, in crisis and the underpinning machinery of the cartel is where the corpse is lying. And this is the painting by Montaigne that I fell in love with uh, when I was very young, and I still, uh, to this, I guess the most recent uh, rendition that I created was probably in 2011 of this work. So what could be more natural? Uh, I'm, I'm interested in systems, in things that turn in on themselves, and uh, this phrase actually came initially from an exhibition that my husband put together. He was a curator, uh, the chief curator at the University of Arizona at the time, and created an exhibition that was titled La Cadena Que No Se Corta, uh, The Unbroken Chain, which was an exhibition about uh, of another, a very different uh, sort of take on uh, Mexican culture and Mexican American culture, uh, the sort of crafts and traditions that are passed from one generation to another. But I somehow managed to introduce death into that as well. <laughs> this, by the way, is a rat that was supplied by Molly Malloy. <laughs> I had it in my freezer uh, for quite some time <laughs> in a Tupperware container, um, and it it began to to chase its tail in this circular container when I brought it out. That's how I drew it. <laughs> I did a residency. I was very fortunate to go down to uh, La Union. Uh, 
New Mexico, and uh, this is a residency, it's called Border Art Residency, which is about 30 minutes from the turnstile. And I went there because I met Charles Baldwin, and I, I read the things that he uh, had, had written for some time, but again, my husband being a curator, he had, um, he, he puts things together, and, and so he, he thought that perhaps my drawing had some relation to this writing. And so I did contact uh, Chuck, and, and we started corresponding, and uh, soon after that, I, I was introduced into an amazing world that um, I have been really fortunate to participate in. And met Julian Corona and Molly Malloy, and also another individual that I will introduce you to. But this is an example, I guess, in another lifetime I might have wanted to be a photographer. Um, but this was a dog that was at the border art residency that I photographed throughout a year. And again, was interested in this whole cycle of something being and then disappearing. And I'm not going to present things in a chronological order. They're in some other um, order like the, uh, the way that I uh, conceive of things. And so this happened prior to the residency. I went with um, Charles Bowden to a, uh, on a, a day trip through the Buenos Aires um, Wildlife Refuge. And we went to a location that was a former outpost for the Minutemen. Oh. And they had uh, bicycles there, just piles of bicycles. And I heard uh, this amazing story that, uh, I think it was a story that Chuck told me, that the um, uh, coyotes who would guide uh, illegal aliens uh, across the border would uh, at some point provide them with bicycles and they would make their way into Tucson, hopefully. And many of these people were arrested or the tires went flat or the bicycles were abandoned. And so the Minutemen, the self-styled guardians of the border would gather up these bicycles and then sell them at auctions and they discovered after a while that the people who were coming to buy the bicycles were the coyotes who would renovate the bicycles and then give them to uh, additional uh, uh, clientele to ride them into the desert and so uh, this is maybe a more humorous example of uh, this sort of cycle that interests me. So I want to introduce you to some people who are very important to me, in case you did not hear the panel that uh, took place a little bit earlier this afternoon. <coughs> this is writer Charles Bowden. This is the one and only occasion that we traveled to Mexico together. It was a day trip that uh, Chuck and Bali and I took, and I picked up uh, many uh, cigarette packages and took uh, quite a few photographs, and uh, it was uh, an amazing day. This man has had an incredible influence on my work. Uh, he provides um, words that uh, inspire images daily. This is my most recent portrait of Charles Bowden. And it's based on a photograph. I take quite a few photographs of people that uh, I know. And I think this was maybe the last photograph I felt that I could get away with. <laughs> As you can see from the, the expression, I just, I think it's, it's an amazing, uh, complicated expression. It's just, uh, this is Julian Cardona, and he is sitting in a little cafe where we would meet. Julian made many things possible for me. He took me to locations that I never would have been able 
to see on my own uh, in the water. And this is, is it uh, Coyote in Dalito? Is that mm -hmm. the, the name of the little uh, restaurant? And this is a photograph of Julian's of the death house, which is central to the story that Charles Bowden wrote uh, for the book Dreamland. And he, Julian, travels to these locations and takes these photographs, I think, at you know, his own peril and all his days. And what uh, I see in his, in his work, and I hope that some of you saw the uh, photographs of abandoned uh, homes and businesses earlier this afternoon. This is Molly Malloy, <laughs> and I think she's the only one who is an official uh, entity. Uh, she is um, the research librarian for Latin American at the border at Mexico State University. And also, the Frontera list is a list she had created, and I learn something new every day. I had, I had no idea that this had only been in existence since 2008. Is that really true? No, it's, it's not in the book. It's in a different sort of form, but since 1997. But if you have not ever seen this, uh, I would recommend uh, looking uh, online at the Frontera list. It's a, a, a daily account of what's going on um, on the border and is a clearinghouse for many um, news entities, especially if you don't have time to look up every you know, single thing that's, um, that's happening. She gathers it all and then adds commentary and then there are many other list members that have commentary and it's, it's an education every day. Uh, this is Molly modeling for me. <laughs> I think this was just prior to the moment that she flipped the bird. <laughs> <laughs> this is another individual who has been very important and I wish that uh, he was here so that you could uh, meet him. Jose Antonio Galvan, also known as El Pastor, directs a mission and takes care of over 100 people usually uh, in Juarez. It's uh, for mentally handicapped people who are, whose lives have been pretty well shattered by drug use. And he also is a painter. And this is uh, a painting of I've, I've purchased several of his paintings, which I think are phenomenal. And this is one of my favorites. This is, uh, uh, if you follow the border at all, you probably know about a uh, sheriff in Arizona in Maricopa County, uh, Joe Arpaio, uh, who uh, has uh, all sorts of uh, interesting policies, including having inmates wear pink underwear. And uh, this is Charles Bowden uh, duking it out, I guess, with uh, Arpaio. And I do love this painting, but uh, if anybody wants to buy it for about $5,000, I'll sell it. <laughs> and I will uh, give the money to the shelter. This is Elvira, who is the cook at the shelter. And she is, uh, I don't know for sure if she's the owner. She's not. Okay. I, I, I asked them, like, yeah. they said no. Yeah, there are many dogs around the shelter, and I, I think that they own themselves. I really don't think that anyone owns them. And there is a, a rather famous dog uh, named Peluro, and he looks friendly <laughs> and harmless enough, but he actually goes around and gathers uh, uh, body parts in the neighborhood and brings them back to the shelter. <laughs> And the police. Oh yes, and to the police. So I just want to give you a little taste of what the uh, population is like. It's like any place, very complicated. There are some people who are in solitary. Perhaps they're dangerous to the rest of the population um, and uh, need to be isolated. 
Sometimes uh, only while their uh, medications are available. Uh, some of them are, are in there for longer term. But there are also people who are just ecstatic to be alive. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the many places that Julian uh, introduced me to, uh, the asylum and to uh, El Pastor, who subsequently has become uh, a good friend. And um, I hope you'll all you know, uh, take a moment and just uh, send him your good thoughts. He's in the hospital recovering from uh, surgery. So this is Julian, and this is this is how I would see him often in profile, driving around the city. Another place he took me that I will never forget uh, is the Lugares Moor. Mm -hmm. And a young man was just delivered fresh from his execution. And they were performing an autopsy. And unlike in an American moor, Photography is allowed, which I was incredibly grateful. They were, they were really kind, generous people. And so this uh, became an inspiration for another of the letters uh, in Abecedario de Juarez, which will be the uh, basis of a book that Julian and I are working on. Um, and Julian has the hard part, he's writing. Uh, stories uh, about uh, individual people and their experiences and how they relate to particular uh, terms that are words that have been developed in Juarez, um, to uh, words that have been invented to describe uh, particular kinds of violence. So I'll show you a few more pictures of the morgue. Uh, while we were there, uh, there were some workers. This was very interesting. It was almost like a game show. They got out a skeleton, which they had already uh, examined and labeled, and uh, saw how quickly they could reassemble it for us. And it was in a matter of minutes. Uh, they were able to assemble this body that had been uh, recovered uh, you know, I probably from a narcofossa, some sort of you know, hidden grave. And there is all sorts of hardware there. There are, you know, handcuffs and many, many guns. Um, you can see one, let me see if I can work this uh, pointer. <laughs> but um, this one was built in a prison and it's made out of leather and pipe uh, and then the other end of the continuum are the, the gold and silver uh, tooled guns which I understand were made by a gunsmith in Phoenix and I saw these and walked over the bridge this was uh, in late February of 2009, I believe, just before the army uh, was uh, going to uh, uh, come into Juarez in a big way. And uh, when I walked over the bridge, I picked up the New York Times and there was one of these uh, gold guns was on the front page of the New York Times. So this is a, a stamp of a work that was inspired by that visit to the morgue. I believe it's owned by someone who's in the audience here. Thank you very much for your support. <laughs> Darla Masterson. I want to show a couple of drawings. This is just a, a, a brief uh, introduction to something that's going to happen. And um, these are a couple of drawings that I did while I was on a Fulbright in Slovakia. And as you can see uh, in one of them, uh, Juarez was still very much on my mind. And I looked on Molly's listserv as usual and opened up a story. And there was a story about a man who ran over 
a little boy and and then just go off. And the the implication was, you know, too bad that you know nothing uh, nothing would be done, he wouldn't be punished. Okay, so I want to give you a little bit of a taste of Dreamland. And this is a book that uh, uh, Charles Gordon wrote again. And then I made images, but some of the images I made for this book I actually made before I ever met uh, Bowden. And he extended the courtesy of just letting me respond to his writing however I needed to. And so I thought that was a good thing to pass on, and so I did the same thing and passed it to a graphic designer. I just said, cut up my drawings, reassemble them, whatever you want to do, um, uh, whatever will make um, the book uh, interesting, do it. So I'm going to read you some excerpts from the book and how I managed to match them up, uh, which I would just page through the manuscript and try to find something that looked like uh, the drawing. Two things stunned me, how much I once believed and how much despite the storm in the skies and the blood on the ground that I still continue to believe. One city is called El Paso, the other Juarez. One state is called Texas, the other Chihuahua. One nation is called the United States, the other Mexico. I find it harder and harder to use these names because they imply border and boundaries and both are breaking down. I'm drifting into a different way of seeing things. I want to say this. I think the death house is how government works on the line. The death house is remarkable only in that it became known. Few will agree with me except for the dead. And they are gagged and kept out of sight by various headings. Illegal immigration, illegal drugs, national security. The list keeps growing, as do the dead. The workers in the death house would meet at Los Arcos to eat and drink and plan their next job. Tasks described as panasadas, roughly meaning grilled meats or barbecues. It is a nice place to resolve the humdrum details of kidnapping, torture, murder, and burial. The various agents involved, the various individuals, well, they're all about their own careers, about advancement and success in life. The dead are incidental to making federal cases, or to moving loads of merchandise, or to getting a little extra spending money for helping out in an execution. But I always stall at this point. My tongue gets thick, words are difficult to utter, my mind races, and yet speech ceases. Hardly anyone knows exactly what is happening, but everyone understands what's happening. A person commits an error, gets picked up, and is never seen again. The nature of the error is of no importance, since such errors can never be rectified. An agency on this side knows of the murders and does nothing. An agency on this side employs the killer and does nothing. An agency on the other side does the murders. A business that flourishes on both sides insists on the murders. Would that be the directory? There is a way out of here, and it is called Lenaton, the lift or the pickup. 
You're going about your business and suddenly men with guns come and you go with them. Sometimes you return as a corpse and this of course is a blessing. Since then your family knows your fate and can visit your grave. But usually you never come back in any form. So you become not even a ghost but a question mark. The dead briefly appear in the newspapers, then are not mentioned again. Hardly anyone is ever charged and convictions run close to zero. Things go up and down, just as in the saloons people do alcohol and cocaine. <laughs> The city thinks of itself as a bustling place with foreign-owned factories where over 200,000 people toil. The noise of all this work is so great that no one ever hears the screams, the gunshots, the knives sliding into flesh. Instead, everyone says the city is about producing objects for export. Car parts, vacuum cleaners, things like that. that became true after I made it. Uh, a, a new strategy developed in Juarez where people were murdered or half murdered and then they were taken to the hospital to be cared for and then uh, one of the uh, new terms in Juarez is to be re-murdered. And so the gunman would come to the hospital and, and murder you again. I met a woman who poked around the disappeared, tried to make note of the missing. She is told by authorities to abandon this unseemly interest. She persists. Then her 14-year-old daughter is taken and raped. She weeps as she explains this new reality. When the bodies were disinterred from the death house and and taken to the morgue, the people simply showed up and formed long lines. They came from various parts of Mexico and distant U.S. cities. They stood in line for at least six days. I believe Luna was there photographing them. Photographers found the people in the lines did not want to have their pictures taken. They had come to claim their dead, but they did not wish their names or stories to be known. And this is somebody that you're already acquainted with if you uh, were here earlier in Molly's presentation. El Cholito. Two bullets tear through his body one afternoon in Colonia Rancho La Macra. As he exits this world, at the corner of Moonfish and Hippocampal Streets. Julie and I actually went and tried to find this location. There is no such intersection. He's about 20 and known as El Cholito, the little hoodlum. He belongs to the Wonderlook Gang in Juarez. He dies near the wall that attempts to lock one nation out of another. They come and they come and they come and talk of sealing the border, of humane borders, of worker permits, of different ID documents. All these engaging proposals are like pissing up a rope. They come, the mountain burns, the world shifts, the dire wolf is gone, the moon still rises, Saturday night promises sins, Sunday repentance, and Monday brown people will push the rooms as you pretend they do not exist. Then they buckle and writhe on the ground and eat dirt and act as if they are swimming. This is the last day before all movement ceases. This is actually a car accident that my son and I witnessed on our way to Tucson. There was a van of illegals, I think there were 
something like 14 people stuffed into a van and a tire blew it because they don't want to spend a lot of money on, on tires. And uh, I think as many cars were involved in the accident, we were stuck outside of Tucson on the freeway for about three hours waiting for them to clear the road. And miraculously, in this instance, no one was killed. But that's usually not the case. This is the bridge. Uh, there's a railway trestle just before you move across the water uh, in El Paso. And when Molly and I would travel together to Juarez, we would generally go by this railway trestle. So it silhouette became relevant. I just have a few more passages from Dreamland. Um, I think it's it's amazing writing, and, uh, and so uh, I hope that uh, you take the opportunity to read the book. We try to fit this into our notion of history, and for centuries our notion of history has been progressive. Every generation lives better than the one before. And the way this is accomplished, the system, well, it will work anywhere if folks will just give it a chance. And so you see, the future is the past, only nicer and nicer. And there is no downbeat, just endless upticks. And the markets vary, but are certain. The energy arrives to satisfy our hungers, the food is bountiful. The women go to surgeons and come out the right size. And the poor will vanish. We have a plan. And war will vanish. We have the right on our side. And drugs will vanish. We will live with a material bliss. And ignorance will vanish. And violence will vanish. And the sea will cough up its fishes and blows. We have the faith. And we'll keep the faith. And so there's nothing to worry about. And anything we worry about is really temporary because something will turn up and fix it. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> uh, these are uh, a few people that tolerate me, along with uh, uh, Molly, Julia, Chuck. I take photographs of them, and sometimes it takes a longer time, sometimes it's rather immediate, but, but they all show up uh, in my drawings. And this is my son who uh, actually played, he's in theater, he played a part of a character named Johnny Chino, uh, who did a drug deal, and so he was really in the mood for this one. <coughs> This sort of notion of, of splitting things into a diptych happened, I think, as a result of working on this book and experiencing pages as they're turning and this sort of animation that occurs when you, you flip through a book and, and see an image shift. It's like a, a small film. This is the person who probably has influenced me the most. This is my father. And he's now 92 years old. Uh, he is a luthier. Uh, he makes uh, violins, violas, and cellos, and repairs them, restrains bows. He's slowed down a lot recently because he, he had a, a brush with uh, death of, about a year and a half ago, but, but he hobbles along and works a few hours a day, uh, whenever we can. <clears throat> this is one of his completed instruments. Um, for me, he's been um, an inspiration uh, because of how he's lived his life. He started out in music, World War II came, and when he returned from the war, he had a son, and so then I uh, went back to school and became a chemical engineer and worked in nuclear research for much of his life. But when he was 60 years old, he walked out on the job. 
and he began to make instruments and play in quartets and uh, and has a, another you know, whole life. These are the tools that I use. People often ask about you know how the drawings are made, and so I don't want to belabor the point, but it's pretty simple technology. Um, it's basically scratching uh, a surface uh, of white clay that's overlaid with India ink, and the tool that I use most is an X-Acto knife. And then if that fails, I, I pull out uh, other things, and then if I'm really in trouble, I start uh, using ink and um, other devices, but I try to keep it as simple as possible. This is what my workspace looks like uh, on a, a day when it's more under control. <laughs> um, and uh, which is not often. I'm, I'm a hoarder, I have to admit, and so I uh, collect a lot of things, and, um, and I, they're, they're everywhere. In those boxes that are under that table are full of stuff. Got a lot of uh, cigarette packages that I'll explain later. One thing I want to make clear is, is that you know, I don't think it's unusual to deal with this sort of subject matter. It's been part of the Judeo-Christian tradition from the beginning. It's certainly part of um, many other cultures of, um, of Mexican culture. If you look at uh, any of the codices, you know, there, there are accounts of you know, violence that are depicted. And of course, as soon as photography was introduced, that became uh, a means to uh, record uh, these situations. This is the Civil War, of course. And then so any disaster that has come along, uh, there has been someone who comes along to uh, take photographs of it. Imagine walking out 
into the street and seeing something like this. I've always been interested in words, which I guess is, is the attraction to uh, Bowden and other writers that uh, I have riffed off of. And in Juarez, they, they have their, their literature as well. And this is one of, of, of a very early example, I guess, of a narcomanta. Uh, or would this be, a, I don't know if this would be this officially a narcomanta. No, this is the, the, the very, very beginning. Yes. When the, the Bible was exploded, they put this, it was a, a Bolina, a mm-hmm. poster, in front of the police and uh, start to yeah, the police morning. Morning. Yes. Uh, But later, uh, you can see how quickly things evolve and these forms of display. And I don't pretend to understand, you know, what's going on with these messages or who they're addressed to. I think, uh, you know, I don't know if it's just a form of intimidation for the general public, but sometimes I get the feeling that they're addressed to also to uh, specific individuals, that uh, they want to make it clear that if they invade their territory, they'll retaliate. One of the things that I did in the course of working on this book that that was a more literal form of illustration, which I I had a hard time with because I I wasn't used to responding literally in a way to to text, but I felt like in some instances it was important to do that, and so I created these little stamps, which I. I think that uh, Chuck came up with a, there was a little analogy um, where, uh, you know, the guns and money are moving uh, south and the drugs and cheap labor are moving north and so there's all this traffic across the border and so I thought perhaps there needed to be some uh, means to tax all of this traffic. And so I started creating stamps and then as I was living on the border and thinking about this every day and making these drawings every day, I think I also just went a little crazy. Uh, there were days when I wouldn't go outside for four days. I would just be working all the time and kind of lost track of the clock. Um, I would be working at night and sleeping during the day. And uh, I think this is one of the first sort of compulsive collections that I made. And the next one was with uh, cigarette packages. That's when the, uh, the collecting really got out of control. And uh, this was inspired again by uh, something in this book uh, where there were these deaths that were occurring in this house and, and some people at least uh, indicate that one of the reasons why a bus was not made was because that it might jeopardize a cigarette smuggling case that was that someone that was going to make some DEA agent's career. So I really got out of control with this. I subsequently went to Europe twice. I've collected cigarette packages all over the world and uh, I think I have a couple thousand now. And there is a connoisseurship to this. I have, um, uh, when Chuck was smoking, I, I collected several of his uh, Lucky Strike packages and did drawings of them. I also, um, unbeknownst to Molly, pulled out a Lucky Strike package that belonged to Jim Funko out of her garbage. <laughs> a filmmaker. <laughs> uh, Jim Franco, uh, um made the film, upstairs there is a film uh, about Sicario, and I'm nervous, and so I can't say the exact title of all will you say it? It's Sicario in 164. Yes. I'm, and uh, uh, that also is worth uh, uh, taking the time to, to look at. 
I won't go into how many how many hands I drew, uh, but uh, this was another collection uh, that I gathered was uh, trying to imagine what all these hands and words were doing. I've made untold numbers of portraits of Charles Bowden, and I have no explanation for this, except that I hear his voice when I'm working. Um, and, and so uh, it seems only natural to make images of the speaker. The event that's in the background of this image is actually um, the figures have been moved and adjusted, but it is based on an actual event where a man was uh, handcuffed uh, to the bars of a window uh, on a street in Juarez where children passed on their way to school. This one was completed for the book, but I have since have revived it. I started getting interested in not only diptychs, but in, in additional complication, um, you know, adding additional panels to these diptychs. And um, I think placing you know, dichotomies and placing contradictory things side by side is kind of a start to understanding the, how complicated some situations are, but, but they definitely are simplifications. And so I started to introduce uh, additional panels to try to examine things a little bit more. And this is one of the works upstairs. These panels are not visible because they are the outer doors of a, an altar, Parsoneros, which is an altar for his house where these people were murdered and killed in Juarez. One of many houses, by the way. It's not a unique house. These are the interior panels. This is uh, Calderon as uh, Socrates uh, with his beard and his pal Obama uh, plays the part of his rich friend Crito. He has his head on his knee. And I don't know if you know the story. This is, is based on um, a, a detail of David's uh, rendition of Socrates, the death of Socrates. And so his friend Crito is saying, you know, Socrates, don't kill yourself, you know, because everyone will blame me. <laughs> this is a base of Dario de Juarez, where I've uh, increased the number of panels significantly from two. And again, uh, will be the basis of uh, a book that's and I are working on. You know, once you, once you have a, a sort of notion about something, it's not like I set out to do something and say, you know, well, I'm going to beat this idea of diptychs to death. It's, it's just that you find yourself doing it and, um, and in different ways. And so in this case, I, I decided to create a, create a mirror. And this is another uh, theme that I, I have been involved in uh, periodically of the Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, this, of course, is Gula or um, Rutney. In the background here, you see a man digging. He's actually one of the uh, members of the community in, uh, I'm going to butcher this, it's uh, Villa de Sal Salvador. Villa de Salvador. Yeah. And um, he's uh, building a library uh, in this uh, neighborhood. I think there were 
you know, 15 young people who were killed. I don't know if anybody still knows the full story of why, but it gives you an idea, uh, you know, what happened in this neighborhood gives you an idea of how resilient and amazing some of the people in Juarez are. And so they decided, rather than uh, to think about these children they had lost, that they would think about the children that were still with them. And so they decided to build a library and community center in one of the abandoned houses in the neighborhood. This is clavo, one of the uh, terms uh, for uh, the uh, book that will come out of uh, Abecedaria de Juarez. And clavo is something hidden, you know, in this case. Um, this is what happens to you after a while, I think, when you start thinking about Juarez. You look through that lens at everything. And so I had a pair of shoes. <coughs> And I noticed at some point that there was this little compartment in the shoe. And I thought, oh my God, did somebody smuggle something in there? And uh, I was, I'm so out of touch with what's going on. I had no idea that this was actually a little compartment that's designed for a pedometer for athletes. You know, I thought for sure that it was, <laughs> it was you know, some sort of uh, you know, tool for smuggling, and I somehow had uh, purchased a pair of shoes that had been used for that. So I decided I had to, you know, tell this joke on my song. Eleven Taro. And then uh, the uh, revised, which I think in some ways I like the earlier version of Limpieza uh, Social. Juarez really, I mean, uh, Calderon really did uh, call citizens of Juarez uh, cockroaches. Mm -hmm. An amazing present. This is for Albuquerque. I guess a little um, nod to uh, Breaking Bad. Charles Bowden wrote another really amazing book, and I'm hoping that it will be published at some point, and uh, it will be our loss if it isn't. And I've started to make images in response to this, and this is a quote uh, from the book that is in the banner. Uh, those are his words. And this is actually something that I encountered on US Route 71, uh, heading north um, from New Orleans. An opossum uh, female that had been killed just minutes uh, before my husband and I arrived, and the babies were still alive and still nursing. It was horrible. I guess to give you an idea of how tolerant Chuck is, I think that this quote, when I first saw it, it existed in a context where this image would make absolutely no sense. But to me, it, it made sense, you know, with, you know, when I extracted it, you know, from that. And so I don't know if, you know, if this would appear in the book, if that particular quote would, would, uh, um, would be on the banner or if it would be something else. And this also is uh, related to this manuscript, which is titled Rhapsody. These are birds that I drew in um, uh, the drawers of the museum uh, at Texas Tech University. Some of the uh, specimens uh, date back to the 1800s. They're actually in better shape than the new ones because they, uh, they used uh, preservatives that are incredibly toxic. <laughs> so, you know, I like to laugh. This also is, uh, these are words that are in, in Rhapsody.
I started a, a I just have a few of these um, because I think this is, this is going on a bit too long, but uh, these are some woodcuts uh, that I started. I started making woodcuts in 2010 and then more or less abandoned them uh, because I had to go to Europe and couldn't take big uh, chunks of wood with me. And this is the very first one. Uh, this is a, a quote uh, from uh, Cormac McCarthy uh, from Sutri. I don't know if you can see the uh, text because part of it is kind of buried in the face uh, in the top. Um, and I'm trying to. You know, a curtain is rising on the Western world. A fine rain of soot, dead bones, and anonymous. I can't even read it. <laughs> I hope you guys can. Um, Oh, okay, well, okay, I'm gonna just move on. Okay, this is another experiment with words and images and uh, kind of a, a play with uh, catch pretty prints, which were, uh, one of their purposes was to teach people how to read. Uh, and they were cheap little broadsides that were printed and there would be images and, and words. And so I decided that uh, maybe uh, it was time to create a new series of uh, catch penny prints. This is a partially cut um, lock that again was started in 2010 and then not completed until about last month. This one is uh, another uh, writer that I've been very interested in, is Mark Strand. And there is a poem of his, this one I actually did write down because I knew it would be impossible for you to see. And uh, I've wanted to do something with his poetry for a long time and I just never have uh, been able to. And then I discovered that uh, I was doing it um, about two months ago uh, without realizing it. It is an old story the way it happens. Sometimes in winter, sometimes not. The listener falls to sleep, the doors to the closets of his unhappiness open, and into his room the misfortunes come. Death by daybreak, death by nightfall, their wooden wings bruising the air, their shadows the spilled milk the world cries over. There is a need for surprise endings, the green field where cows burn like newsprint, where the farmer sits and stares, where nothing, when it happens, is never terrible enough. And this is the matrix for the woodcut that I just finished, which is up in the gallery.